Gracious God, as we prepare to enter this holy week, we are drawn to the flickering flame. It burns brightly in our hearts. May the radiance of Christ shine brightly this day and throughout the sacred week that now lies before us. whether on site or online, enter this sanctuary, this home of West Plains Church family. Bring your joys and be thankful, bring your troubles and be trusting, bring your hearts to share in God's love. Well, we're about to sing our Palm Sunday processional hymn, and you had a taste of it just a moment ago, Voices United 122, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. And I'm going to suggest that you come up those of you with palms, and place them on either side. 
And here's the deal. I don't think the original Palm Sunday was orderly. <laughs> so this is your chance to enjoy some creative chaos. There is no right way to do this. So just enjoy. And I think uh, Darlene and Judy Langford probably will be the leaders for this little chaos session. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> I'd you to now turn in your bulletins to our prayer and candle lighting. We embarked on our Lenten journey some six weeks ago, and each week along the way we've lit a candle to mark our progress. We've now arrived at the holy city of Jerusalem, and so let us pray together. With eager hearts and open hands, Holy One, we welcome Jesus until he refuses the power we offer him, choosing to become our servant. We pick up the faith we had laid on the ground before him and put it back on the shelf where it belongs. Our fear keeps us from being able to follow him all the way to that lonely hill that is his destination and destiny. Hosanna, steadfast God, save us. 
Help us to let our fears, our doubts, our faithlessness slip from our lives to fall at your feet, so we may stand with our Savior, Jesus Christ, who comes in your name, in your glory, in your grace to save us. Kyrie eleison Christ eleison of despair proclaim it to the sons of sadness. Christ has come to save us. Hosanna in the highest. Well, hello everyone and welcome to West Plains Worship for Palm Sunday, the first day of Holy Week and a very warm welcome to those of you who joined with us via the internet. Looking ahead this week, Good Friday worship will take place this coming Friday at the usual time of 10.30 a.m. here in West Plains. Easter Sunday is, of course, a week from today when we will joyously celebrate the resurrection and partake in Holy Communion. We give thanks, as we always do, to those who offer financial support to the mission and ministry of this community of faith. If you're interested in any information about our community, check the website www.westplains.ca. Many, many thanks to Leanne and to the choir for the splendid afternoon of music that many of us enjoyed as part of the Live at West Plains concert series yesterday afternoon. I might suggest that you take the week for a bit of relaxation, Leanne, but alas, it's Holy Week. (laughs) So you'll have to make do with our deep appreciation for the work that goes on into curating that splendid concert series. In community celebrations to lift up this week, Ethel Ballantyne's birthday will take place Good Friday, this coming Friday. Best wishes, Ethel, from all of us. And now I invite Judy Hansberger to lead us in the prayer of elimination. God of courage and comfort. As we follow the stories of Christ's journey to the cross, inspire us with the courage to follow him, even when others turn against him. And comfort us, knowing that you will walk with us through every challenge, just as you walked with Jesus your living word, amen. The responsive reading is Psalm 118, parts one, three, and four, which you'll find on page 837 of Voices United. Let Israel now say, God's love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, God's love endures forever. Let those who fear God say, God's love endures forever. Open to me the gates of the temple that I may enter and give thanks to God. This is the gate of God. Through it, the righteous shall enter. I thank you, for you have answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone which the builders rejected 
has become the chief cornerstone. This is God's doing, marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, O God, we pray. God, we pray, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of God. We bless you from the house of God. God, our God, has given us light. With palm branches in hand, let us march to the altar. You are my God, and I will thank you. You are my God, and I will extol you. The second reading is Isaiah chapter 50, verses 4 to 9. The Lord God has given me the tongue of a teacher, that I may know how to sustain the weary with a word. Morning by morning he wakens, wakens my ear to listen as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I did not turn backwards. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. The Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who are my adversaries? Let them confront me. It is the Lord God who helps me, who will declare me guilty. All of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. The Gospel reading is Luke chapter 19, verses 28 to 40. After he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God, joyfully, with a loud voice, for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. For the word of God in scripture, among us and within us, thanks be to God. Our next hymn is in Four Voices. Four Voices, number 128. Uh, it's a Beautiful tune, and good luck getting it out of your head for the rest of the day. <laughs>
The whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would shout out. We don't often think of inanimate objects shouting. And yet, as the Gospel writer points out, metaphorically at least, they have a way of doing exactly that. Let me offer a non-scriptural example. Several years ago, Yoko Ono, who in her years of maturity continues to be delightfully outspoken, posted a photo on her Twitter now X feed that many people, especially in the United States, found both disturbing and controversial. The photo appeared on the day that Yoko Ono and John Lennon would have celebrated their 44th wedding anniversary, had Lennon not been gunned down outside their Manhattan apartment on, in December of 1980. The photograph that Yoko Ono offered showed the misty skyline of New York City in the foreground, a pair of glasses rested with one lens almost completely obscured by a spatter of dried blood. These were the glasses that John Lennon was wearing when the assassin's bullet struck him. The caption that Lennon's widow placed on the photograph offered this explanation. The death of a loved one is a hollowing experience. Despite decades passing, our son Sean and I still miss him. But Yoko Ono went on to make it clear that she wanted to do more than pay homage to the dead. The bloodied glasses had a message to shout out to the American public, a message she knew that they very much needed to hear. Over 1.5 million citizens have been killed by guns in the USA since John Lennon was shot and killed December 8th, 1980. We are turning this beautiful country into a war zone. Together, let us bring back America, the green land of peace. For Yoko Ono, John Lennon's glasses proclaim the same message of peace that Jesus imagined the stones of Jerusalem shouting forth on that fateful day when, in an act of creative street theater, he entered the holy city of Jerusalem to begin what would be his final journey. In its way, the city of Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday, like the gun-happy landscape of the present-day United States, had become a war zone. Knowing that there was a price on his head, Jesus might have chosen in all the chaos and commotion of Judea's capital at Passover to enter the city of Jerusalem surreptitiously. After all, there were two and a half million people in Jerusalem that day, and one more Galilean would certainly not be noticed. These visitors to the city, mostly pious Jews, had returned from all over the Mediterranean to observe the Passover feast at the temple, as was their yearly custom. This was the Olympics, the Grey Cup party in Canada Day rolled into one. But Jesus did not sneak into the city. He chose instead to make a very public, very ceremonial entrance. He had a firm plan in mind and a big statement to make. And so he sent his disciples to borrow a donkey to carry him into the city. It had been the tradition of the Roman generals to ride into town on a war horse as a demonstration of the empire's power and might, and as a warning to the citizens of client kingdoms to behave themselves. Jesus deliberately chose to construct a different kind of procession. In their book entitled The Last Week, biblical scholars Marcus Borg and John Dominic Crossan described two very different Palm Sunday processions. From the west came Pilate draped in the gaudy glory of imperial power, horses, chariots, and gleaming armor. 
He was moving in with the Roman army at the beginning of Passover week to make sure that nothing got out of hand in this tinderbox of a city. Insurrection was in the air with the memory of God's deliverance of the Hebrew people from slavery in Egypt as the focus of attention. When Pilate entered Jerusalem from the west, Borgen Crossan suggests there was another procession entering from the east. This was a commoner's procession. It featured Jesus of Nazareth wearing an ordinary robe, humbly riding on a young donkey. Make no mistake, this was not a spontaneous event, but rather a highly ritualized, symbolic act. It was sacred theater. Luke, in his description, wants to make the link for us to the ninth chapter of the book of the prophet Zechariah, which describes the coming of a new kind of king, a king of peace, who will enter the world to disrupt and dismantle the weaponry of war. As Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem on his borrowed donkey, the people crowded the streets and they recognized the symbolism. They hailed him as Messiah, the one who would save them from their Roman overlords. Shouts of praise went up to the skies, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Significantly, the word king has been deliberately inserted into a quotation from Psalm 118 that the people were using. The psalm verse doesn't actually use the word king. As they sing, the people place palm branches in the path of this humble new king they are welcoming. Then to their chorus, they add a further couplet, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. As Luke describes it for us, this is more than a song of heavenly rest and hope in the world to come. Luke's whole gospel is an affirmation that the realm of heaven has drawn near in Jesus, and it has drawn near expressly to challenge the kingdoms of this world. And so as Luke paints the scene, the multitude lining the way and waving their palm branches deliberately echoes the song of the multitude of the heavenly host, those angels who had sung their beautiful song of welcome and peace to shepherds on a Judean hillside at the time of Jesus' birth some 33 years before. But this fickle multitude in Jerusalem, seemingly so full of praise and psalms, soon melts away as it becomes clear to them that Jesus will not fulfill the popular image of Messiah the warrior who will rescue Judea from the yoke of Roman imperial oppression. If we were to read the next few verses of Luke's gospel, we would see that Jesus knows exactly what is going on as the crowds begin to thin. When he moved further into the city of Jerusalem, Jesus wept over it. If the disciples and even the very stones were indeed shouting his message of peace to the world, Nobody was listening to them. And so, through his tears, Jesus issues a stern warning to the people of the holy city that sounds precise, <coughs> wounded, and perhaps even a little bitter. Jesus is the supreme peacemaker, and yet his true role is hidden from the eyes of the multitude who want something else. When he doesn't seem to deliver on that something, the crowd reverses its attitude of praise and begins denouncing him as a fraud. The sorrow-filled Jesus says, the days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And so, with this entry into the city of Jerusalem, there begins a holy week that will be the climax of a journey that in Luke's account had actually begun in the Gospel's ninth chapter. This final week is eventful and revealing. In it, we can see how the tide of popular opinion continues to turn against Jesus a little more each day as the week progresses. 
On Monday, he cleanses the temple, overturning the tables of the annoyed and distraught money changers. This violent scene provokes the religious leaders to intensify the effort to get rid of him. On Tuesday, he engages in discourse with these leaders and curses the fig tree for being barren, a sober warning to those who choose not to hear God's word. On Wednesday, he is anointed in Bethany, much to the discomfort of Judith. <coughs> and on Thursday, which we in the worship tradition of the church call Maundy Thursday, we find Jesus preparing for the Passover meal. This was also the evening of the betrayal and arrest in Gethsemane in the beginning of the trials. The same crowd that lauded him so recently now demands his public execution. Friday is the day of the crucifixion. By Saturday, he is in the tomb, and on Sunday comes the day of resurrection, the day of victory. And you thought you were busy. But as we begin to turn our attention to the events of that Holy Week, we do need to pause and ask ourselves why it is that the same crowds who cried Hosanna on the first day were shouting, crucify him by week's end. Perhaps it was because they wanted an instant kingdom and what Jesus offered them was an eternal kingdom that was both already and not yet and consequently a realm they found unsatisfying. In our culture, our own culture of instant gratification, we might be well equipped to understand the crowd's impatience with waiting and with delay. Or perhaps these crowds that lined the Jerusalem streets on that first Palm Sunday wanted entertainment, not spiritual enrichment. We can probably resonate with that one as well, or maybe they simply recognized that the demands of God's realm were too high. Jesus had consistently resisted any attempt to make his message or his ministry a handmaid to popular culture or a prop to the government or to any religious group. And when this became clear, the crowds began to melt away and the stones shouted their message of peace to fewer and fewer ears. But before we give up too easily on the message of the peaceful stones, the message to Jerusalem, or we get in touch with Yoko Ono to commiserate with her that the message shouted by the photo of John Lennon's glasses seems to have fallen on deliberately blocked up ears. We need to remember that what the stones also cry out is first and foremost, Jesus' prophecy of the sure and the certain triumph of God. There is a truth that is too good and too holy ever to be shut down, and that's it. It may be temporarily silenced, but this silencing will never be for long. And if the disciples were to fall away by cowardice or complacence, God will raise up more. As John the Baptist said in his message by the Jordan River, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. In evoking the image of the shouting stones, Jesus also echoes the prophetic warning of the second chapter of the book of Habakkuk. Injustice will not long prevail. The very stones of the house that is built on corruption, says the prophet, will cry out from the wall. Finally, we need to remind ourselves that the crowds that sang and waved palms and laid their garments are, after all, in many ways, still with Jesus and still part of the kingdom movement that Jesus brought. This morning, almost 2,000 years later, those of us who waved our palm branches are a vital part of that great multitude that continues through time to proclaim God's mission of peace in our world. Those of you who have visited the modern city of Jerusalem may have visited a teardrop-shaped chapel that is located halfway down the Mount of Olives. It's called Dominus Flavit, which is Latin for the Lord weeps. And it is the traditional place where Jesus stood to weep over the state of the holy city. 
though the ongoing war may prevent it this year. Traditionally, Christian pilgrims gather in this little chapel to share together Holy Communion as they themselves move on their pilgrimage toward Jerusalem. When they look out from the chapel, they have a view of a city still divided with people of different faiths squabbling seemingly interminably over the very same real estate. Nevertheless, the pilgrims turn back to each other and as they pass the bread, they repeat the words, this is my body broken for you. Then they share the cup of wine saying, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. This moment allows the pilgrim visitors to recall the great cost of reconciliation, how God sent God's beloved child Jesus into the world to bring all back to God's powerful love. If we humans had really heard the message of the stones of Jerusalem, we would have no need of the reminder offered in the image of John Lennon's blood-spattered glasses. But humanity has proved over the last two millennia to be clueless when it comes to peace. Nevertheless, the message of the stones of Jerusalem does resonate for us each time that we modern, modern disciples gather. And when, as often happens, especially in our communion liturgy, it is our custom to say to one another, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, to which the traditional response of the faithful is always, and also with you. And so on this Palm Sunday 2024 with Yoko and Sean Lennon and the great multitude of Jesus' followers throughout the world, let us 21st century Christians affirm our resistance to the violence and destructiveness of the world and affirm the brilliant resilience of God's eternal realm of shalom. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Thank you.
Let us pray. Gracious and compassionate God, compared with the gift of, gift of your beloved given for our sake, what we offer today seems so small. Bless our gifts with your love so that they may accomplish more than we can even imagine. Bless our lives as well so that what we do and say will demonstrate our commitment to follow you and our awareness that such commitment may be costly. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let us gather our hearts and minds in prayer. In Jesus Christ, O God, you came to us in humility, reaching out to all God's little ones with mercy and compassion. You ask us to do the same. In gratitude for the mercy and compassion we have known, we pray for those who find themselves in difficult circumstances. Hear us now as we pray for those who are unhoused in our communities and for refugees wherever they are able to take shelter. For all who find themselves without enough resources to cope when necessary things are so costly. For those who live in isolated communities and lack the access, care, and technology that most of us take for granted. Embrace them, O God, in your mercy and humble us, lest we put too much trust in our lifestyles as the source of life's goodness. Hear us as we pray for all those who have been humbled by unexpected circumstances and for those who are facing illness or who are recovering from surgery, remembering at this time within our own community of faith, Tony, Christina, Jan, Marnie, Joan, and Tilly. We pray for those who know death or disaster, fear or failure for victims of crime and those who suffer through the misjudgment of others. And we pray also for those who suffer because of the consequences of their own actions and choices. Embrace them, O God, in your mercy and humble us, lest we imagine we can live our lives untouched by trouble. Hear us as we pray for all those who have not yet learned the lessons of humility, for those who live carelessly or drive recklessly, endangering themselves and others. For those who abuse the trust and power in their positions, betraying those whose interests are in, the hand, in their hands and who may elect to incite war or violence. And we pray for those who mislead others to protect their own interests or indulge their fame with no thought for either the truth or the consequences. Humble them, O God, in your mercy and humble us if we are tempted to ignore the responsibility that you give us to care for our neighbor's needs. Create in us the compassion and courage we need as we come to the cross 
of Christ. And as in humility we pray the words Jesus taught us, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, this is a day for beautiful music, and we get another example. Voices United, number 346, there in God's garden. the days ahead, 
May the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who lives with a wounded heart open your hearts to love. May you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you.